All right. Okay, welcome to Twirl Talk Tuesday. And tonight is um, just, I'm going to be like girl fanning and gushing the whole time because we were lucky enough tonight to get Judge Rosemary Aquilina. And um, there's just so many wonderful things to talk about with her. And I'm going to go through a little history and then you can correct me on anything I've missed. But mostly I became familiar with Judge Aquilina because my daughter is a NASAR survivor. So I got to sit in the courtroom for days on days on days and get to see Judge Aquilina in action. So I have to preface this a little bit and go backwards in that um, in the beginning, because of the law, um, we weren't really fans of Judge Aquilina. So she had to make a ruling that... Um, made it really difficult. And uh, we probably won't go into all the specifics of that, but it was basically a gag order. And then we went into sentencing and then we got to see Judge Aquilina really in action as she created a, um, between the prosecuting attorney and what was happening, all of the survivors got a platform for um, giving their statements in the sentencing of Larry Nassar. And Sterling, my daughter, and Rachel Den Hollander and Kaylee Lorenz were to be the last three people giving their uh, statements. And because so many more people came forward, and I'm quite honestly going to credit Judge Aquilina and the comfort of the class of the courtroom and um, the courage of everyone coming forward, that more and more and more came forward. And everyone had their moment. So Judge Aquilina came here as an immigrant, a child with her parents. And the short, the Reader's Digest condensed version is going to school, going to law school, studying English and journalism, I believe, then going to, she was at Michigan State, then went to Western Michigan, go Broncos for Cooley Law School and um, joined the military as the first JAG officer in the Nash Michigan National Guard. And um, she teaches legislative process now in law school and is a circuit court judge in Ingham County. So Judge Aquilina, thank you so much for finding a window of time to, to talk with us tonight. Um, thank you for excited. inviting me. <laughs> well, I think that our sport, which is mainly a female dominant sport, is all about the empowerment of young women. And there was no better moment to see the empowerment of young women than in those hours and days in the courtroom that you provided. So let's go back in your history a little bit, because you also now, I can't wait to talk about your book. I can't wait to talk about the Audible that's coming about with your memoir. And so tell me the driving force in you growing up because you seem to be this person that like, if it's not given to me, I'm going to darn well figure out how to do it. What was the driving force in that? Yeah. So, you know, we all are made up of who we are by the time we're five years old. Uh, our makeup, I think, is pretty well destined. And uh, of course, we change as we grow and, and learn things. But when I was very young uh, and through no fault of my own or my parents and their great parents, but um, my Grandparents had immigrated. My father from Malta, my father joined the military. Long story, I won't go into it, but he ends up meeting my mother in Germany while he's going to medical school. And so he's Maltese, she's German. I'm born nine months later after they're born. Then my brother, 11 months and two days after me, with two crying babies, my dad could not go to, he couldn't study. So we hop on a plane. My brother and I come over here stateless because, um, my father hadn't been a citizen for 10 years and Germany only recognized the citizenship of the father, not the mother. So we come over stateless and I live with my brother and my mother who goes to work and my grandparents. And I think that my grandparents are my parents. Okay. Because kids learn from what they see and hear, but words, the connotation of what a word means is from the action. So my uncle, who was the youngest of my grandparents' um, children, was in high school. My brother and I are hearing him call my grandparents mom and pa. We're calling them nunnu and nunna, which means uh, grandmother and grandfather in Maltese. But in my head, it means mom and dad. I don't know it means grandparent because my grandparents take care of us. Fast forward a few years, I only saw my dad 
during medical school a couple times a year. So he was like Santa Claus. He was just this guy who came and brought presents. He wasn't my dad. So when they finally, when he's finished and we, they pick me up and my brother from my grandparents' house, we move away and I'm not told. I'm not told. And they thought, you know, they didn't have to tell me anything, but I'm not told this is mom and dad. These are your grandparents and we need to go and start our own life. So my whole life, I have felt since I was about five, I have felt kidnapped without a voice, without explanation. And it started this journey for my whole life of being a troublemaker. I'm not gonna do things your way. I'm not gonna eat the food that you put in front of me. I want the smart toys. I don't want the stupid dolls. If, if my brother's getting something, why can't I have it? And my grandparents had always said, this America is the land of opportunity. You can be anything, you can do anything. But yet the world told me something different. So I have been on this school of hard knocks journey my whole damn life. So I've also, through that experience, intuitively listened to my friends. Um, I can tell you that, and I didn't have many friends because I was different, an immigrant. I said words that were wrong because my parents pronounced them differently. I didn't know better. I had a few good friends along the way and my best friend when I was in um, junior high and then high school. Uh, who corrected me kindly, um, but I went through a lot of uh, people bullying me because I was different, and I fought back because I wanted to just be who my grandparents said, which is, you can be anything. So I've had this really, um, this history of trying to listen, trying to help others. I can tell you in eighth grade, there was a girl in my class who got a haircut, and it didn't, it was not flattering, so the other girls were making fun of her, and I walked right up to her, and I said, you know, I think you ought to tell your mother to take you back and get something a little bit different. And she looked at me and she was a little upset and she did exactly that. And the next day she came to me and she said, you were the only one that told me I like this much better. And she did, she looked terrific. And she said, thank you for being honest. So I've had this sort of, um, you know, kidnapped feeling, using my voice, trying to speak up for myself and in so doing have learned along the way that even when people don't like when I tell them the truth, it's the right thing to do. And so that's really the, a very long yet short version of how I got to be this old outspoken and don't give a crap about what the men tell me I should do or can't do. Well, what I hear you saying and what I picked up from you along the way is that I am a huge fan, fan of authenticity. Like, I don't, I don't care if I agree or disagree, just be authentic. And so let's take it back a little bit with young women who had to be extremely vulnerable in front of you. So they were being authentic, which made it hugely impactful. And so the vulnerability of these young women, which is a tough balance, I think, for young women nowadays, how did you view that? as a mentor, as a leader of women, when these people stood in front of you? Yeah, so it's, it, that's really hard to explain, except that intuitively, I have felt whether I'm wearing the military uniform or whether I'm you know, the mom or all the things that I have done, a lawyer um, and, and now a judge, with whatever kind of cape or outfit you are wearing, right? You have to, um, use that to empower others. So you can do good or you can do evil. I sort of see it that way. And I know that uh, my children don't listen to me. I promise you they'll listen to each one of you over me. And that's just the way you all know that's true too, because you've done the same thing, right? Um, and so I know that if, if someone like me, like one of you was going to talk to my kids, I would want you to listen to them, inspire them, and give them something positive that they actually hear. So what I try to do is to listen, to believe, to give the people in front of me an open platform. What would you like me to know? How can I help you? And then leave them with something that they can take with them to know that not only did I listen, but I think they matter. And whatever they've brought me does not define them. They'll define who they are and who they want to be. And they have the power to do that. 
And so you try to use the power of the robe. Uh, what you saw with Nasser is what I've done for 16 years that I've worn the robe is to empower those people in front of me, one case, one person at a time. It's not always victims. As sometimes it's, well, often it's defendants saying, don't let this crime, what you've done define you. And what I get back, um, I've, I've had over the 16 years, hundreds, maybe thousands of letters, comments, um, people coming back to me and saying, Judge, you were the first person who told me I mattered. And it always goes to my gut that how sad that it takes someone getting in front of a judge for whatever reason, that that's the first time they felt or were told they mattered. So I take my job very seriously and try to impart something positive out of whatever negative thing someone has brought to me. And I think that's really the greatest gift we all can can give. And I hope, you know, that whoever talks to my children does the same. Well, and what you are, were able to convey over and over again, and it could easily have been viewed as just, she's saying that again, and it never, you know, we were some of the people that had to be there every day and it never became trite. It never became, um, pacifying. So we, how that translates, I think, to our world is in the coaching designer choreographic world is that looking at each person as an individual in front of you. So do you feel like that's something that you've really strived to do in your courtroom is that not all criminals are the same, not all rock stars are the same. Like, how do we value all of these people separately and validate them? Well, you know, you're absolutely right. I treat everybody differently. One size does not fit all. And it was interesting. Some of the um, people that I've heard from, some of the viewers from Nasser, um, and sometimes in other cases, they'll say, you know, we thought you weren't paying attention until you talked. And what I always do is I always have a pen. I'm a writer. And um, I always, I listen to what's being said to me. And I write down some nugget that I can then turn back at them and say, this is important this is pay attention to this you said this because a lot of people come in front of me and they don't even remember what they said um but i play, pay close attention and try to volley that back to them as this is valuable and you're valuable um and i think one size the judges who or coaches or anybody who does one size fits all is doing a disservice and i know that in coaching and i think in on the bench for the most part doesn't work with everyone I think kindness produces uh, winners, whether it's in sports, education, or on the, the bench. And if you bully someone into seeing what's happened, um, it, it has a negative effect. I don't think that bullying anybody belongs in sports, in life, on the bench. And I know some judges do it. You saw me not being nice to Nasser, so you can say to me, well, what are you talking about? But you know what? He didn't get it. And it really pissed me off. And one of the things I have to look at when I sentence anybody is, can they be rehabilitated? Uh, is society going to be protected? Punishment of defendant, because the punishment piece has to be there. Will it de deter others? Um, is the sentence proportional to what they did? And sadly, while most defendants will get out and own what they did and will work with them through probation and other resources we have, whether it's on the outside or jail or prison, Nasser still, and he never got it, he still today didn't get it. Um, for me, that was very, very troubling. And I don't know, I've sort of gone off on a tangent if I answered your question, but um, I think it's important that we treat everybody as an individual. No, I think that that's exactly what we're talking about in that you made a really great comment in bullying in that some of the um, producers of great athletes sometimes think they need to bully. And when you look at, you know, the IU football program right now is really shining. And when you watch how these athletes react to their coach about great coach, he's an amazing coach. And they're running by as he's doing a press conference. I guarantee they said that before they were winning. So, you know, it's kind of like that impact that you're having in those moments and I know that each girl that came up in front of you, they were hungry for validation. They were hungry to, to have their moment, 
which was a gift, but also that validation you gave them, you know, um, Judge Aquiline and I were talking before this and she um, very earnestly asked like how it was in the back of the courtroom for me. And I said, well, first of all, I didn't know I could cry for 11 hours straight, but to have each person matter and to have each story be different, it wasn't just this conglomerate of people. So as we translate that into the coaching world, it's not just this conglomerate of people and you're not just trying to find that one golden nugget. It's like, how can you make each person valuable regardless? Like you never ask like how many hours, how many days, how many years? It was that I don't care if it was one time with this man, it mattered. And that that had impact. So um, so let's venture off. You said something about writing and you said something about you know, your, your writing as you're up there, but also let me swerve a little bit and pivot into your creative world in that you have two books out now and there's an audible memoir coming out. So I want to hear about that. Yeah. And how have you taken your judge robe and your military and how has creative creativity worked within those fibers? So my philosophy has always been since I became, you know, I went to, I had two babies in law school. So I, I feel like I've never stopped working. I've never had a break. And what I've learned is that if we don't do self-care, which is the, the term now, 40 years ago, there was no such term, but intuitively I knew for me that I needed a break and I could not afford to go to Florida or, or do other things that other people could do. And I always wanted to be a writer. And my dad had said, when I said, I'm going to college to be a writer, he said, well, how are you going to support yourself? And he was very unhappy. He's a doctor, wanted me to go to medical school. No one in the world wants me to be a doctor, let alone a vet. I, it's not me. Right. So I looked at him and again, in defiance, I looked at him and said, okay, I'll be a lawyer. And I did that because doctors hate lawyers. So let's, let's start there. And another piece of my defiance. But, you know, the creative side of me has gotten me through childhood and law school and, and all of that. So fast forward to start to working and having a husband and kids and all these things that I'm doing. And I need time to myself because that's just me. So I shut the door on my lunch hours on my first job and said, I'm going to get back to writing. And so I would make sure I would write an hour a day. And that is kind of like that workout. You get that adrenaline. And so I looked forward to it every day. And that's really my self-care. So um, I have things I've, you know, situations in the military, in my practice, uh, when I worked in the legislature uh, from teaching, I have just a lot of characters around me and of course, always on the bench. So I always have kept notebooks. I always write. And so I have my first book, which is Feel No Evil, and then I have Triple Cross Killer, and, and then All Rise, and now I have Just Watch Me, which is the memoir. So in all of the fiction books, the first three, um, you will see situations that um, just pissed me off or that I really liked, and they're fiction, but they're based on real life. For example, All Rise that came out this year is about a judge who is being bullied by the chief judge, and one day she's just had enough and she says, I'd rather be a hairdresser. And then as she opens up her salon and her staff comes with her and a, a people she sentenced who really liked her came and said, I'm going to work for you. And she starts losing control. She gets arrested because she's arrested now for the murder of the chief judge. And um, it's just a, a really fun story and a lot of great characters. But the foundation of that is that the chief judge was bullying me. And would I like to murder him? Yes. Could I do that? No. But can I write about it? Hell yes. There's been self-care. So a girlfriend a long time ago gave me this t-shirt. You've probably seen it out in the marketplace that says, you know, be careful. You might end up in one of my novels. So all of you might end up in one of my novels. So people who piss me off, my self-care is I go and write. And so I can do whatever I want in my writing. Um, in Triple Cross Killer, uh, there's a dog, um, Recon, and Recon is an actual dog, uh, but I loved Recon, the testimony, and so um, Recon, I heard, have heard many officers, he, he's retired now, but many officers talk about Recon who've worked with him, and in one particular case, there was a, a break-in, 
And the officers didn't know it was on a second floor and they didn't know if they should go up there. So recon went up there and recon glommed onto the ankle of the perpetrator. And then the officers came up and they put the handcuffs on him and all of that. So at sentencing, this guy just didn't get it. He decided instead of saying, I'm sorry, he was going to complain to me about how recon didn't let go of his ankle soon enough. I just thought, recon, you are the coolest dog ever. You know, and I explained to the guy, you break in someone's house, you're lucky that you just have the bite marks. You could be in, in a coffin. Um, so I write for that. Now, just watch me as a memoir. And I said, you know, I'm a, a little bit, I felt too young. I know I'm old, but I felt too young to write one. Um, but I met Reese Witherspoon, who was interested in the whole, how did you know to ask, what would you like me to know? In the Nasser case, where do you come from? How is it that, you know, this has blown up and, and you did what you did? Which to me, I've been doing it now for 16 years at that point, what, 14 years? And she's like, don't, don't you know what you did? I'm like, you know, I, I don't still quite get it because I've been doing it. So I, anyways, and I spent about three hours or so with her. And she just bombarded me with questions. It was good girlfriend talk. She would just love to be part of this group. She's just so real. And she asked me a lot of questions and she says, you, you've got to write this. And I just sort of, huh? So my story is really some of the things we've already talked about, how I grew up, um, some of the things I've gone through, because I think that um, people look at judges or doctors or coaches or whomever, and they, they think that we just arrived at that station and that we haven't gone through anything. So Just Watch Me is out on Audible. There is not a hard book yet. There will be at some point, but it's out on Audible. Uh, it's out, up for pre-sale now. It's coming out the 10th officially. Um, but it's really about my life, my journey, um, some of the not so nice things that have happened to me um, that really helped me listen and give voice to others. So I'm using my um, writing as my way of self-care, because if you don't do self-care, you self-implode. I'm having a lot of fun with it, and I'm hoping that along the way I'm giving voice and confidence and inspiring others. Oh my gosh. I'm loving this so much because your version of being contradictory is so heartwarming because we're kind of a sport that's the Rodney Danger field of sports. And so we spend a lot of time explaining what we do. And instead, it's like so wonderful to just show. You, I mean, the blessing of YouTube is we can send people to YouTube and go, you think we're your mama's majorette? And no, no, this is not it. And send them back. And so you have been a person who it appears that you let performance speak for itself. So I think that that's a wonderful tie-in that we just need to let performance speak for itself. That we just do our job, do our thing, fight the norm, go ahead and fight the standard, but then let performance speak for ourselves. So I want to circle back a little bit to the courtroom and that, um, you have a wonderful story with your children and from everything I've read and, you know, I've, I'm kind of a Judge Aquilina study because of all of our, the time that we had and your daughter was in the courtroom every day and I was fascinated by that decision. So mm -hmm. tell me about the relevance of your daughter being in the courtroom. So my daughter, Johanna, she's my middle child. She was, uh, I think, 17 at the time and she was in high school. And she had exams, so she couldn't come the first few days. And then, you know, I don't, when I have a case in front of me, I try to, I keep the news away from me because I need, want to only rule on what's in front of me, what the lawyers, the law and all of that. And I don't talk about it until after the case uh, with my family, no matter what the case. So I didn't talk about it, but my daughter at the dinner table said, mom, I want to come to court with you. Can I come? I, I want to see this. And she said, I know some of those girls. Can you, can you tell me what, what's going on? I said, I, I can't, but I will call your principal. So I called the principal and said, Johanna's coming with me. And the principal uh, was really great. And he said, you know what? She's going to have a better education with you than in school for these days that, that she's with you. So she came, she brought her boyfriend and her best friend, I think for one day, my daughter was there at least three days. And you have to understand my daughter is the poster child for rebellious. I say yes, she says no. I say come home at nine, she's home at you know midnight and I'm calling the cops saying, uh, Johanna, if you're not here, I'm making a police report. And she knows I'll do it. Um, 
she challenges me. I have the drug dogs at my door when I'm signing warrants. And I say, oh, sir, I see you got the drug do dog. Uh, how about searching my house? He's like, but I'd have to make an arrest. Okay, that's fine with me. So <laughs> my daughter and I have had, you know, if I'm going to do it to your kids, I'm going to do it to mine. Okay, I don't have a double standard in my life. Okay. At least I try not to, right? Uh-huh. So my daughter, since she was about 14, 13, 14, when I'm asking where are you going and I'm calling the other mothers, is there really a party, you know, what's going on and, and all of those kinds of things. And I'm one of the few moms who does that, I learn. She starts calling me judge. She, for probably three or four years before the Nasser case, stopped calling me mom, didn't kiss me goodnight, um, just called me judge. So, okay, there's where we were. So she wanted to go to court. And she sat there and she, like the rest of the people that were watching, was stoic and sobbing. And I thought it was good for her. Um, she was of an age where she could hear these things. She should know about them. We should all have these conversations and opened up a whole conversation after the case about grooming and all those things. But what it really did was she said, mom, well, I know so many of those girls, some go to my high school. Um, how is it I didn't know about this? Why didn't they tell us? If they couldn't tell their parents, you know, us kids talk about a lot. Why couldn't they share it? Because we all go through things. And so we had a really, uh, several really great conversations about that. And she started calling me mom. I don't even know that she knew that she was doing it. But suddenly after being in the courtroom, after being part of all of that, my daughter called me mom. And if that's the only good thing that came out of that case, that's enough for me. Oh, it's um, amazing. Yeah. And the transformations that happened in so many good ways, you know, because of the platform that was given and the vulnerability that was exposed, that there's yeah. so many good things. And when you watch the things that came after, the world was changed because of those days. Yeah. And- I have Say, can I just want to interrupt with just a little story? Um, she, so she's in high school and there were several girls who went there. Um, Cause there were some things that, you know, will never be in the paper. I don't know that this has been disclosed but I know it because of my daughter. Um, there were, there was some kind of free hour or something. And there was a bunch of boys. Not that boys are bad. I love boys and men. So I don't, you know, but there were, there were bullies. And what they did is they wrote one of the survivors names plus Nasser. And my daughter watched that. And after being in the courtroom and she's watching this and she's saying, you, you can't do this. And they're really taunting um, this whole thing. And, and she, like her stomach turned and she turned around and I was really proud of her. She went to the principal's office and she said, you need to come down now and she was very upset and they did and there were several people who got suspended fast forward a few weeks one of those because then i heard the the rest of the story from one of the moms who thanked me about johanna doing this and one of the moms said you know what i ran into the mom of one of those boys who did that at myers and she started screaming at me how dare you do this against my child and the mom said, excuse me? And the woman breast bumped her and left. And I said, you know, that's assault. She said, well, I don't want to do anything about it, but I just, I can't believe that there are people who think that the girls did this for some other kind of notoriety. Um, this is a kind of conversation we need to continue to have, to teach about grooming, about bullying, about, um, it, I see all kinds of crimes, name a crime, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. And there's, I think the statistic is about 3% of false reporting. It is no higher for, for rape, for sexual assault, for the, any of the categories than any other category. Mm -hmm. There's not one of those girls, not one who wouldn't give back every moment in court, every newspaper article, every nickel, if this never happened. 
And so these conversations, and I want to thank you for having them, are that important because we still have this veil of shame and we have got to dispel that and get rid of it and show power from these things and not let other people uh, make fun, belittle, or weaken um, the pain that this causes. I, I think that the, you're exactly right. And part of our discussions too, like we have um, Michael Lopez on this call, who is an astounding male athlete and is now coaching and judging. And we've had a discussion on troll talks with males in the sport and the equal side of things from the bullying and from the intimidation and from all of that with our males in the sport. So human behavior in itself all of these examples show us how things need to be changed so that the world is fair for all, not just for the chosen few who think they have the power. So it's the platforms that have been given have been really enlightening and I've been thrilled to have these discussions. So that leads directly to me opening the gallery because um, I know that there are some people that have questions. So what I would like to do is um, I've got a gallery view and if anybody has a question for Judge Aquilina, then please feel free to raise your hand. I know a couple of you do. And if not, we can. We certainly have things that we can go on and talk about. So Leslie, I'm gonna pick on you first because I know that you had some questions. You can pick on me. <laughs> <laughs> so Judge Aquilina, I did a little research too to find out more about you. And I did know that you were born in Germany, um, but I just was curious as to how you started with English and journalism and then decided to go to a law degree. And then I was wondering how you and your sister ended up practicing law together, how you both ended up in that yeah. position. So as I said, my father wanted me to be a doctor or not less than a doctor. And you know, I don't put people in categories and boxes because I've been there and I don't like it. And so I, I literally said, you know, I'm, I'm going to go be a lawyer. But my undergraduate, I stood my ground and I did English and journalism. And then I also got my teaching degree. And I have taught ever since I teach at both Michigan State and uh, Cooley Law School and have I've taught at Cooley for about 35 years and at Michigan State for 12 or 13 years. I've received awards at both schools and I just love, love, love teaching and mentoring the students. But um, so I held true to that thinking I will be a writer no matter what. And of course you don't have to go to pre-law. That's the beauty of law school. You can go to pre-med or um, I don't know, anything you want and then go to law school. So I held my ground and did what I wanted to do. Got my teaching degree figuring that if my, my dad was mad enough he wouldn't help me pay for anything so I could uh, support myself. And then I went to law school. And then, you know, I decided to join the military because I had always wanted to join it. And of course I had two babies in school. And then um, as I was waiting for the bar results, I was filling out applications. My Navy was my first choice. And then they said, well, you have to be able to travel anywhere in the world. I said, oh, I can't do that. So I did some research and National Guard was family friendly. So I joined that, however, my father didn't talk to me. My husband didn't talk to me. They were mad as hell. How can you dare do this? You're a mom. I'm like, what does that have to do with anything? And so I joined, but my application sat on the corner of a general's desk for about a year. And I thought it was well because I was naturalized and the paperwork was taking longer. Oh, but no, it was a woman because I was a woman. They couldn't believe this woman wanted to get in the boys club. So you know what, girls, we have to use what we have. So what did I do? I decided that they couldn't turn down a volunteer. So I put on my tightest jeans and my cowboy boots that I always wear and a reasonable top. It was, you know, not, nothing sexy about it, but I was a lot thinner and prettier then. And I walked in, I got permission to volunteer because they knew I was coming in anyway from the Colonel. So I went in, I volunteered, started working on a court martial that they gave me to research. And I made sure that I had coffee where the general had coffee, which was on the first floor. And we were up in the second floor in this building. So I had my break when the general had his. And of course I was in jeans and everyone's in uniform. And I, he sort of asked me a couple questions. And then I took my coffee and donut up to the JAG office. And as I am there, 
the generals, or I'm sorry, the colonel is motioning me over and pointing because he's getting yelled at and he's holding the phone like this because the general's yelling at him. What is that girl doing here? Why isn't she in a uniform? And the colonel said, well, she's volunteering. I couldn't turn it down because she's been approved. It's just sitting some, on someone's desk. And so he said, get that girl in a uniform now. So I was sworn in the very next uh, weekend. That's how I got in the guard. I mean, I have had to fight for everything. And then my sister, my brothers are doctors. My, one, my brother Tom's an anesthesiologist. My, brother's, uh, my brother Joe, who's the one that's 11 months younger than me, is a doctor and a, a urologist and worked with my dad. My sister, the youngest, was not going to be less than me. She would have preferred to be a jeweler, uh, something like that, but she went to law school because she wasn't going to be less than me. And eventually when she got divorced, she came and worked with me and now she's the friend of the court and doing very, very well. But, you know, it's that um, when you have a strong male in the house, uh, it shapes you in ways that you may not have imagined, but you can have your voice if you choose to. That's so awesome. So tell me about, because I am, one of my weird thoughts and concerns is because I work with women, I feel like there are so many programs for minorities and for women and empowerment. So I'm going to use Michael a second. And so my concern, I have a concern in life about vibrant young teenage males, that I feel like there is this vacuum. And when I know about my daughter's friends that have committed suicide, and when I see these gregarious young men feeling desperate and lonely, mm -hmm. who is the voice for them? So Michael, I'm gonna use you just a second, that you're in a women's world, basically in the sporting world, you fought your own battles. What do you need from the people around you to empower you? And if you were asking Judge Aquilina, in this situation of that a woman has battled the sexes and has battled the, the stereotypes, what would you ask as a male moving forward and looking at your career? That what do you need? Well, well, for one, I I always think um, it's always that motive that motivation, you know, just you know, just just that uh, just that confirmation that you know. You can do it if, it, if that answers uh, the question. Just to, you know, just to be, just for us to be recognized, uh, you know, you know, you're just, you're just as, you're just as val valuable uh, as, as everybody else. Because then, because when, because when I hear something like that, that just pushes me even more and just motivates me even more. I feel exactly the same way. When someone tells me no, or you're less than, I say, yeah, well, I'm gonna show you I'm more than, and I'm gonna get you to yes. Yeah. Um, and, and I think I love that you are here, Michael, because see, when I see men at, at these female gatherings, which many of them are, um, the interesting thing is I, I feel like you're one of the girls, like, you know, you, we are, we, as women, we are inclusive. And I think that you are part of the solution because men and women have to partner together for true equality. And the older echelon, the patriarchal, you know, we run the world, um, hopefully that will go away. So we can really um, all meet, you know, our highest achievement and the goals, who we want to be without uh, being in boxes of you're a woman and you can't, or you're a man and you can, or you're, you're transgender and you can't. I mean, why do we need these things? Why can't we just be humans who partner together for each other's success? Right. Well, I think one of the important discussions we've had when we talked about earlier was diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the lack of diversity in our act activities. So whether it's dance, color guard, twirling, and one of the one of the things that really made me stand up and pay attention because I had to really think about who are my students of color because to me they're all the same. But in that record, in that thought of them all being the same, I realized the lack of recognition that they're different and I need to embrace that and I need to embrace their differences. So it becomes complicated as coaches, as mentors that 
that I want to, I want to say that I view everyone the same, but in that statement, whether it's men in the sport or whether it's, you know, one of the guys in the discussion or my, one of the people of color, then I want to make sure I'm recognizing those differences and honoring them. So that's been a discussion we've had. Yeah, you know, what's interesting about that, I think, is that violence against women and girls and also boys because, or and you can put them in whatever transgender, gay, lesbian, whatever boxes you want. Um, it's a consequence of this gender um, inequality. And if we look at people and as equal, uh, whether it's pay equity or equality in job and treatment hierarchy, um, I think that we will find less violence, but because we have this power struggle all the time, uh, it lends itself to violence and poor treatment as an accepted norm. And we really need to break out of that. Um, you know, female sports, for example, is less than male. And there are certain sports that make more money than the male sports, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they get less money because they're simply female. Um, there, there's so much inequality. We have to balance it out. And it doesn't matter if you're male or female, gay or, gay or straight, what, whatever you are. Um, we, we just can't make decisions um, to, to put people higher and lower based on their gender. Yeah, and, and it's interesting for us because it goes back to the parents. And so we, you know, when we look at our Japanese athletes and our European athletes, we have so many more men involved in the activity because of the cultural acceptance of it. And so my favorite thing, and, and Kathy, anybody who's been at the world championships, one of my favorite things is the men's warm up. Like I love the men's warm up. And to see the men participate, we just want to have more of that happen. So, um, we as a group, you know, need to continue to work on that. And it's about the balance of how we encourage people and how we get parents to accept that. Um, let me go backwards just a little bit. So Michael, when you started twirling, just so Judge Aquilina, how did you start? Well, uh, well, I, I always say it started at a family get together because I was really into, into uh, archery, you know, with bow and, ar bow and arrows, but uh, there was a, there was an, uh, an archery arrow laying on the floor and my aunt picked it up and started twirling it like it was a baton and come to find out she was a feature twirl in high school and then from there on it just stuck with me it's like I found my sport it's amazing it's so fun it's so wonderful to hear everybody's stories because everybody's path is so different so Kathy you're my person I always pick on you know during twirl talks because I love your questions and um do you have anything for Judge Aquilina that you'd like to bring up and ask her what what do you think that um, we can do outside of our sport to become more involved in the movement of um, gender equity and, and making everyone feel important? Because I think we all get such tunnel vision in our own little road. Baton twirling is what we do. It, it mm -hmm. really makes us totally engrossed in because it has to sometimes. So what avenues are there outside of that that we could become involved in socially to help make a difference? That's a really good question. You know, um, the sports world I think is so important in everybody's life. And I think people forget that Olympians, the best athletes in the world started in a gym class in kindergarten, right? They all started in, in school somewhere, um, you know, kicking around a football in your house or twirling or as, as Michael just said, and then you go up through the ranks in school. And I think that each one of you have this place to mentor younger children, to show them that they should, you know, to talk to them about following their gut, not being afraid to change courses, not letting anyone dictate your life, uh, be who you want to be. You can be strong, you can be an athlete, you can, um, you know, emerge as the, the greatest athlete or a coach or a friend to someone who is an athlete, but we need to partner together and um, talk about things like 
body parts and bullying and grooming and um, speaking up for the others. Uh, one of the things I do when I go around and do motivational speaking is, and, and um, I love it, as I said, when men are here, but there are a lot of bullying terms that kids use that we as adults use, and we can stop that. If you're at a party, um, don't let somebody say, oh, she's just pissed off because she's got PMS. I say, you know, um, I have PMS and it means promote, mentor and support others. Okay. Love it. Turn around that negative language that you hear every single day. Man up is another bullying term for men. Man up means you shut up and take it, sir. No, we need to change that. So man up is when you speak out about something that's happened to you. When you ask for help, that means you're strong. When you speak out and you speak up for a woman or another man who's being bullied or harassed. So man up needs to stand for someone who is strong on behalf of someone else. If we change that bullying language, that will change the world. But also to really mentor those and help those who are coming from the below grades on up into your athletic world, I think will change the universe. So tell me about, you saw over 140 women at their most vulnerable. Tell me in their most vulnerable moments, where and how did you see strength and that mm. they would be okay? So I ended up, because I always let everybody speak. I talked to, I think 169, there were 156 who I dubbed um, sister survivors. And when they came to me, they were uh, not sure they should even be in the courtroom, what they were going to say. Many had never spoken um, about what they were going to tell me in open court to their families. Some had, some hadn't, some had only told partial things. So um, I think that First of all, in relationships, whatever they are, you should always ask what I ask, which is what would you like me to know and how can I help? I think that if you really want to help someone, do not ask the why question. Why needs to retire in science, okay? Why has no place in helping anyone? And when you ask why, and I want you to think about in your own lives, when you have come home and your mother says, why didn't you finish your homework? Why were you late? Why didn't you make your bed, right? Just those small things. What did you do? You shut down. You were not about to give your mother any big explanation or a real story. You just made up an excuse and got the heck out of there, right? So having a safe place for these women to speak is important. And so everybody around us should have a safe place place where we ask, what would you like me to know? And how can I help? Because that shows them that you believe them, you're ready to listen, and you're there for them. And that really jumpstarts someone's healing because they feel safe to tell their story, something that they've been carrying around, a bag of rocks. You know, they carry around this pain. And when they can release it with you, that starts changing their world. And then when you can affirm to them, not only will I help you, but you are stronger. How wonderful that you trusted me with this, how strong you are. Uh, you will survive this and you'll be better for it. Give them some kind of positive affirmation. I have seen this not just with the Nasser case, but with thousands of cases that once you tell them, I'm listening, I believe you. Uh, you are empowering them to tell their story, to believe in themselves and to go forward with their life in a positive way. And I think that's really all that anybody can ask is to be validated. When you validate someone that helps their healing and to never, ever, ever put a time limit on someone's healing. I think the important thing for um, the victims who came in front of me to turn them into survivors and thrivers was to have an open, honest discussion, to listen, to believe, to tell them they mattered, but then also to let them know, and it wasn't just me, they have a lot of, there was a huge support system that developed out of this, that it's okay if it takes you a month to heal, a lifetime to heal, years and years to heal, that everybody heals in their own space and there's no pressure, there's no shame and there's no blame. Um, 
And, and I think all of those things are things we need to do in our everyday life, whether it's with your best friend, your husband, your wife, uh, your, your child, is to be there and help them along. Because when we are supporting someone, uh, that helps them turn into thrivers um, much more quickly than when we're blaming them of, well, why is it taking you so long? You had your day, well, why, why aren't you doing this? Um, the why question needs to retire in science. What you're and saying is so wonderful, I think, because it's so applicable to the development of any child, regardless of if they're overcoming trauma, is that they each have their own pace. And what you're going to see in them is the value at that moment. That, that that doesn't mean it's the value of that they will always be. So that I love that you said that there's no time limit on healing. That can be applied too. There's no time limit on your growth. So whatever plan you're going to be on and whatever you're going to be growth-wise. Um, so you're a pretty self-made woman. Did you ever have a mentor and how did that mentor shape you? Yeah, you know, I, people ask me that and I am hard pressed. I, I'm probably the strangest answer of anybody on the planet, but aside from my grandparents who always, they were my rocks and still they're dead, but I talk to them every day. I mean, they just told me I could be anything and that I mattered to them so much. Um, you know, I was a product, I was born in 1958. So we had the fifties and the sixties and the seventies. And, you know, those were fun years, I think, for growth, um, but they were difficult years, I think, for women. And every decade, we sort of gain a little bit of ground. Um, I was a pretty much sheltered when I was little, uh, when I was growing up, even as a teenager. And so I looked at a couple of things that I think, you know, it, it's not that I'm looking at um, Kennedy. I knew Kennedy. I loved Kennedy. My family was all about Kennedy and he got shot. And I remember coming home from kindergarten and you know, I've always sort of read about him and I love a lot of things he said. But in terms of mentoring, I looked at people like Cher, who wore like seven different um, eyeshadows and just made her path. And Barbara Streisand and Diana Ross and Aretha Franklin and Ella Fitzgerald. And to me, those were people who broke through the little housewife dress and did what they wanted to do. And it wasn't about, oh, I want to wear that glitzy thing. It was these women are making a damn mark. I want to make a mark too. And that really stuck with me. And Gloria Steinem, you know, she wasn't very popular in the 60s and 70s when she was saying all these things and people tore her down and look what changes she made in the world. And it's not that I grew up and said, I want, you know, all of this to happen. I never imagined that I would be on this talk circuit and all of the things that have happened to me. But those are the people that I looked at and said, damn, if they can do it, I can do it. And then, you know, because I, I, I'm a writer at heart, um, I love Gone with the Wind because I love Scarlet and I love that she didn't have money and she made the beautiful dress out of the, you know, the, the green drapery because nothing was gonna keep her down. And at the end of the movie, when she says, tomorrow is another day, that's really been my philosophy. I'll do better tomorrow. I'll make a different mark tomorrow. I'll be stronger tomorrow. I'm not going to let yesterday or today bring me down tomorrow. I'm going to make another step forward. And through all of those people, um, I've been able to follow my gut, uh, not be afraid of changing course and not let anyone dictate what I want for my life's course to be. And I've been able to be who I want, not what someone has told me I should be. And I think I'm a lot happier for it. Well, it sounds like you just absorb inspiration, that you find inspiration and soak it in and take the parts that work for you. And um, before we close out here, I want to see if anyone has any questions that I might have missed. Uh, Kelly, go ahead and unmute yourself. I have wondered since seeing clips of the trial, mm -hmm. how you knew how important it was to let each of the women speak. Yeah. I have wondered since I have seen it, I think I understand a little bit more now after hearing your background, but is that ever addressed in law school or where, that's what I was wondering, you see it yeah. so rarely. If ever, I mean, not that I go to court very often, but certainly to see you do that, I was 
profoundly moved by you knowing that that mm -hmm. needed to be done. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine many other judges in the country would have done that or known how important it was to do it. So since I've taken the bench, I have been bullied. Uh, you can say, well, judges shouldn't be bullied. You're these big people. Well, no, um, the sheriff didn't like me. The prosecutors, you know, everybody wants to, to leave. They want to go do their own thing. The case is over. They, they don't want me to, to talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I read the Crime Victims Rights Act very broadly. And here's the thing, you know, growing up and I didn't have a voice and you know, I was saying funny words that uh, copying my parents and all of that. Um, no one listened to my story. No one helped me. Very few people along the way. And so as a lawyer and, and in the military, you know, I was the minority for a very, very long time. And I learned the importance of listening, not just to the person who was there, but sometimes people would say, you know, can you talk to my husband, my, my uh, child, my neighbor knows this. And you really get a, a good picture then of what's going on. So as a judge, I made it my mission from the first day I was sworn in to not just listen to the victim, not just listen to defendant, but to listen to each and every person who's affected by the case. And let me just give you one example. I, there was a family in Okemos who had just bought a house and they were so excited about it and they fixed it up and unpacked. And you all know how much work that is. They decided to go to Florida. The friends of the I think the kids were in high school and um, middle school. They said, oh, we're going to Florida. So everybody knew they were going to Florida. They did not know, however, that the mom's sister was going to stay in the house. So there were some people who broke in the house. They, they found her. They duct taped her to the bed. They ransacked the house. But because she, it was a surprise that she was there, they did a sloppy job. And so she was very quiet and she got out of the sheets and the duct tape and all of that. And she snuck out of the house when it was quiet and she grabbed her purse and keys. And then she got into her car, thankfully, and locked the door. And they came back for more. And just as she's turning on the engine, it was really like a horror show. Just as she's turning on the engine, one of the thieves um, threw themselves on the windshield to try to break in to get her. And she put the car in reverse and she had called 911 on her cell phone and that she could hear in the distance the cops coming. And she raced down and she stopped the cop and said, this is me, they're at the house and all of that. So fast forward, we're now at the sentencing. Who got to speak as a victim? Was it just the sister in the home? No. Crime has a rippling effect. I've seen it in my practice, in my life, everything you do has a rippling effect. It's important to me as a judge to know how that ripple uh, affected people, what happened, who was hurt, and for, to give everybody that voice for healing. So I tell you the story about the house that was burglared because now they come home from Florida. The sister was traumatized because she was there in the duct tape and assaulted and all of that. But her, her own sister who owned the house was then assaulted. The husband, the children, they couldn't sleep. They got an alarm. They bought a dog. They did everything they could do so they could sleep in the house. When their aunt, the sister was there, came to visit, she couldn't stay there at night. She would briefly stay. She could barely be in the house. It affected the family so deeply that this house that they loved, they sold. They moved out of the neighborhood and they moved out of the area. Because crime has a rippling effect. And that is true in every single case. So for the Nasser case, it wasn't just that each of those girls were assaulted. Their families were assaulted. The referring doctor was assaulted. The community was assaulted. And if it would have taken 70 days or 700 days, I'd still be listening because it's that important to recognize the rippling effect of crime. So I've always done it for that reason. And I've taken my slaps for it. On the day they tell me I can't do it, I will get off the bench. I will lobby for it. Mm. I, I just think it is the way it needs to be done. I know other people don't do it. I was, I've been called out by some judges who've called me and said, how dare you? You need to resign. But most judges and others have called me and said, I've looked at what you've done and I'm going to start doing it. Mm. I have a whole bunch of attorneys who've said, Judge, we are now asking our clients, what would you like me to know? And I can't believe how much more information I get. No wonder you get that information. Mm. So um, 
I know what I do works. I'm there for the community who elected me. I have a broad reading of who a crime victim is because of that rippling effect. And I don't in, intend on changing unless someone makes me and then I'll just fight against that uh, wave as I have been doing. Yes, well, hopefully they don't make you stop. Hopefully they encourage others to take your lead. Well, thanks to people like you who agree and who carry the conversation forward. I mean, I'm not changing the world myself. It's all because of you. If you think it's valuable, talk about it. You know, we all can do this together. Um, one voice turns into two, turns into 20, turns into 200, turns into 2,000, 2 million, 20 million. And that's what you're all doing here. So I applaud all of you. Well, we watched the world change because we saw other people have platforms and sentencings because you gave our daughters a platform. So it was really interesting to watch the dynamic effect of all that happened. And it was also really nice to be the parent in a situation where we could look at our daughters and say, as much as you're suffering, you're changing the world. And that was really huge. So, um, you know, everyone who works with kids, everyone who has a voice with kids has the opportunity to do something wonderful because we never know where those kids are going to go. And I mean, you never knew when you got assigned that case, what this would turn into, you know, no idea, no idea what, what no. would happen with that. So we're going to wrap this up. And I, again, I'm so honored to have this time together and to be a Judge Aquilina fan. And tell us your books again, please, in your Audible that's coming out, because we're going to so, spread the word. So the Audible that is coming out is called Just Watch Me. And it's, it's for pre-sale now, but it'll be released the 10th. And the other books, uh, All Rise, Triple Cross Killer and Feel No Evil. If you just go on Amazon, you should be able to see all of them. Um, and I want to tell you, if you belong to book clubs, I will zoom in with your book club and we'll talk about the books. Uh, I do that a lot. It's a great fun. And um, I've also had book clubs who send me the books and then I sign them and then uh, mail them back. So it's up to you. I'm just uh, enjoying what I do and, and uh, I love meeting people. So I, I so much appreciated this time with you. Thank you. Well, thank you. You know, I am a firm believer and we never know the good that lies ahead. And as hard as things were, and from the moment of my daughter's first phone call with me, and when we started this journey, we could never have predicted all of the good that would have come out of it. But I, we certainly believe that it would. And one of those is you. So thank you, Judge Aquilina, for your time tonight. We have a dynamic, smart, amazing group of people around the world who are involved in our activity, whether it's twirling, dance, guard, and just my friends. Um, they're really honored to be able to speak with you, and I know that you're going to have a great impact. So thank you for your time tonight, and thank you, everyone, for joining. I love these moments. So yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening, and stay strong and healthy. Thank you. Hey, thank can, I, can I just say something just okay. real quick? Yes. Judge, I just, uh, Judge, I just want to say th uh, thank you so much for your uh, inspiring inspiring words. I mean, truly appreciate it. It's very, very relatable. And it just proves that that uh, even though you can't, I mean, it, I mean, even though it sounds cliche, even though people try to beat you down, you, you can still go up. You, that's all you can do. You can that's still right. prove them wrong. I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you. Just remember the power that you have inside is unshakable when you stay true to yourself. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Totally. Thank you, Thank you everyone, so much. Thank have you. a great Bye. night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much Thank for your time. Yeah, anytime. Thank you.